All right, good evening, guys. I'm just going to get started now. Um, this is being recorded, so if you have to drop off at any point, then you can find the recording on YouTube. Um, hi, my name is Niraj. I'm a current SFP trainee in Northwest London, working at Northwick Park Hospital, and I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Janvi Shah, who's an SFP trainee in Northeast London, who can't make it here today. Uh, you've probably seen her on our previous uh, webinars about the SFP. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as always, just gonna start with a quick disclaimer. Uh, so all of the information that we've included in our slides today are just based on information that we've passed, you know, that have been has been passed down from other applicants and also is available in the public domain. Um, it goes without saying that obviously we can't divulge specific information about um, particular interviews or marking criteria. And of course, any of the medicine um, involved in this, in this uh, teaching session is purely for learning purposes rather than anything else. So um, I'm just going to talk to you briefly today about the clinical interview um, for the Specialised Foundation Programme. It can be really good to have some interaction. So if you guys make use of the chat, that would be really good. So a lot of, um, or almost all, actually all of the SFP SUOAs will have a clinical interview component as well as the academic interview. And the reason for that is because you have one less, uh, you have one less clinical block generally. So they need to make sure that you have a good baseline and that you're competent to start off with and that you're going to be a safe F1 and aren't going to need all six blocks to complete your foundation training um, clinically. So you need to benchmark at a certain point and that's the that's the reason behind the clinical interview as well as to provide an extra scoring mechanism. So these interviews can vary quite a lot between different deaneries. A lot of them will involve an A2E assessment and clinical prioritization. Uh, some of them may be more of a discussion. So what I would do is if you do get an interview, speak to somebody who has uh, gone through the process at the deanery you're applying to, but also have a look at the applicant guide online because they can be quite useful in telling you what to expect. Uh, London, for example, are very transparent on what the interviews contain and they provide example scenarios. I know that not all of the deaneries are the same, but um, by speaking to previous applicants, you should be able to get a good idea um, as, to, as to what to prepare for. But generally speaking, these are the things they test. So normally more than one clinical priority or unwell patient in an out of hour setting. So you might be told that you're the F1 at night or on the weekend or in the evening, um, and you might have to prioritize different patients based on their clinical needs. You also, uh, more often than not, need to talk through how you would assess an unwell patient in the A to E approach. Um, and that might extend to testing some of your general clinical knowledge as well, which we'll come on to later. And then you might also have ethical considerations or discussions uh, that arise from the, um, from the scenarios that you're dealing with. So um, for most of the SFP pretty much all of the SFP deaneries, you will have prep time before the interview to review a scenario. So again, this is deanery specific and you should speak to people who have interviewed in the ones you're applying for. But I know for London, for example, we had about 15 minutes of prep time where we were given both the academic and the clinical scenarios at once. So um, Janvi and I have just come up with a couple of do's and don'ts um, for your prep time. So it's really important that you read the whole scenario. Some of these can be quite text heavy um, because they contain details of multiple patients. So make sure that you read the whole thing and that you make brief notes on the scenario because you may or may not have it on the screen when you're in the interview. And even if you do have it on the screen, you don't really want to be reading from the screen uh, while, you're, while you're trying to answer questions. Um, you should use a structure, so A2E, as I've said, that, that's going to be what everyone uses, um, and be prepared to prioritise the sickest patient. So you might not have a task when you have the interview, uh, when you have like the interview information, it might just be details of three patients. So patient one who has chest pain and shortness of breath, patient two who's becoming agitated on the ward, and patient three who's desaturating, for example. There might not actually be any specific ask of you at that stage, but in your prep time, I would just write a number down, like you know, three, then two, then one, or I'm gonna see one, then two, then three, and just be prepared to justify your choice. Uh, a lot of the clinical interview doesn't have sort of right or wrong answers, but it's more about how you justify things. 
And obviously in real life, people would see the patients they give you in different orders anyway. So just be prepared to justify whatever you choose. Make sure that you have a drink with you because you can be doing a lot of talking. And in terms of the don'ts, uh, don't feel like you need to write for the whole of the prep time. So that goes for both the academic and the clinical interviews. Like I said, there's a lot of information that you get presented in, very, in a very short period of time. So don't feel like you need to spend the entire time writing down the exact scenario on a whole piece of A4 paper. That's probably a waste of time because, again, if you want to glance down at your paper, it will look bad if you're trying to unpick things from, um, from, from the volumes that you've written. So write down the most important things and the things that are going to help you um, answer the questions. And if there's anything in particular that stands out to you or that you think you can say, that would set you apart from other candidates and of course write that down so you don't forget it don't feel like you need to um, allocate 50 percent of your prep time to clinical and 50 percent to academic um, i guess this kind of depends on where your natural comfort lies but for most of us we are most comfortable with the clinical scenarios because it's, it's what you train to do in medical school whereas the academic scenarios generally take a bit more thinking and it's it's a it's less easy to sort of wing it in the academic side of the interview, sorry, in the, yeah, in the academic side of the interview than the clinical side. It's not the end of the world if you don't get to prep absolutely everything in the clinical interview, because again, you're gonna fall back on your A2E approach anyway. Whereas on the academic side, if you haven't fully prepared or read the abstract, then obviously you can, you can get into a bit of trouble there. Uh, so don't feel like you have to allocate 50% to academic, 50% to clinical. When you're doing your mock interviews with your friends or with your SFP mentors, then try a few things out and see what works for you in terms of splitting your preparation time. Whatever works for you, stick to that in your actual interview. And obviously don't do anything unsafe. Remember that you are uh, being assessed at the level of an F1, no more and no less. So make sure that if at any point during the interview, you think that, uh, okay, if this was me in real life, I'd feel quite uncomfortable. Make sure you say that and say, you know, I'd call for help really early. Um, don't go above your sort of level of uh, competence and do anything crazy because that just gives a bad impression um so yeah that's our those are our top tips for preparation time and thinking about things before you go to interview the other thing that i found was really useful uh, when me and my friends were practicing is actually imagining that you're in the scenario that it's not just an abstract scenario um it's something that's happening in real life because then you don't forget to do small things so for example if you've got three patients and you go and see the one with the chest pain picture yourself going to see a patient with chest pain the first thing you're actually going to do in reality is and i know we say it for exams but what you do in real life is you look at the patient from the end of the bed and then you're going to go over to them and have a chat with them take a brief history you're not going to launch straight into a to eing them without any of that if they're obviously unless they're unconscious so um the small things that show that you can actually be a doctor on the ward come quite naturally when you imagine yourself doing the steps in real life rather than just saying them out loud. Okay, um, and then there are a couple of things that you should do before you go and even see the patient. So I've talked about how to prioritize them, um, or actually I haven't really talked about how to prioritize them, just that you will be prioritizing them, uh, but we'll go through how later on. Um, what makes you sound really slick as a candidate is say, saying that, you know, uh, I can see that there are multiple unwell um, patients here and I would like to prioritise patient number one with the chest pain because I think they could be having an acute myocardial infarction. Um, on my way to seeing the patient, I would ask the nurses if they could take an up-to-date set of observations. I would also jot down their most recent observations and any trends in them as well. I would also ask the nursing staff if they can to cite a cannula and take some bloods and make sure that all of the um, documentation, so the patient's drug charts, et cetera, are by the bedside. I would also contact my registrar or SHO and let them know that I'm going to see a potentially very unwell patient and that I might need their help. So that kind of encapsulates what you would do in real life, because imagine picking up a bleep, or answering a bleep from a, nursing, uh, from a member of the nursing staff about somebody with chest pain. You are going to ask all of those things. What are their OBS? Are they on any oxygen? Um, do do you have any trends in the vital signs? Can you take some bloods? All of that kind of stuff will really help you when you get to the patient in real life and it helps you in your interview as well. And make sure you're utilizing all members of the team. So if there are like three or four patients verbalizing that you would ask your SHO or Reg if somebody could come and help, 
or even even making mention of the wider people in the MDT. So some hospitals, for example, have a hospital at night team with nurse practitioners who can go and do cannulas, et cetera. So if one of your tasks is a cannula, then you could say quite simply, well, I don't think that's important at the moment, uh, depending on why it's needed, but I would ask the hospital at night team or one of the site practitioners to go and put the cannula in if possible. Just um, throwing a question out there. If you were told, um, so say you answer this bleep and the examiner tells you, so the nursing staff tell you that there's a patient with um, a blood pressure that is unrecordable, their heart rate is 40 and their saturations are 80% on 15 liters per minute of oxygen and they want you to go and see them. What would your immediate response be in that scenario? So you've got pressure, bradycardia and hypoxia. Yeah, exactly. So I would, um, yeah, I, I would basically put it out straight as a peri arrest or even cardiac arrest call, um, because it's quite clear that although you can go and see them as the F1, you're going to need help. And that's obvious from the outset. So there's no harm in saying, well, I'm actually really concerned over those observations. And it's quite clear that they're going to need more help than I can give them. Um, and I need more people around me. So I would say to the nursing staff, I'll come and see them. But please call 2222 and put out a peri arrest or a cardiac arrest call. That exact situation happened to me on one of my night shifts. I went to a patient who I was just asked to see, uh, and that was the exact scenario, and I put out a cardiac arrest call because I needed more people there. So after you've prioritized the patients, uh, I realize I haven't talked about how we would prioritize them yet, so maybe I'll just hold back on this uh, and ask you guys how you would prioritize patients. What kind of approaches can you use? Yeah, exactly. So I would I would do exactly that. So I would use the A2E approach again for prioritizing. If you've got a patient who is choking, yeah, news is also a good one, actually. Um, although remember that news, news is a useful thing and it's it's um a common reflex to ask in hospital when someone says, you know, what what are you can you come and see this person? You ask them what's their news score. What's really helpful is a trend in the news score. If someone's been using seven all day, that's fine. Well, it's not fine, but it's, it's probably not as bad as someone who's using a two and is now using a six, for example. So I would go with what, <clears throat> what Bhargav has said there in terms of using an A2E approach. If you've got someone who's got stridor, somebody who's got uh, acute shortness of breath, and someone who's got chest pain, is a really good example of an airway, a breathing, and a circulation problem. I would say, well, there are three critically un potentially critically unwell patients here. And ideally, what I would do is contact my registrar and ask if there are other people who can go and see the two patients that I'm not able to see. But at the moment, I'm going to prioritize patient number one because I think they could potentially have an airway problem. In the meantime, I'd also put out a cardiac arrest call. I would then think about seeing patients number two and three. What I would say to the nursing staff, though, is that if patients two or three deteriorate, then they can escalate that straight to my senior <clears throat> who'll put out a cardiac arrest call if they need to. So what you're doing there is you're showing the examiners why you've prioritized one patient over the other, but you've also showed them that you're keeping all of the patients safe because you're giving the nursing staff very clear instructions to escalate above you or to put out a cardiac arrest or peri-arrest call if the patients get any worse or if they're any more concerned. And that way, it's not like you're just forgetting about those two patients. You are still doing something for them. You're just not going to them um, yourself. Also asking for things like, can you keep them on a cardiac monitor? Can you keep doing regular observations, etc.? And yeah, I, Christy, I do agree with the news thing. Um, <clears throat> but then if you've got a patient with a new, news 4, news 5 and news 6, it's difficult to say I'm going to see them in order of news. That makes sense. But it's definitely a good thing to know. Uh, and that's why a trend in observations is so useful. OK, so after you've prioritized and you've picked who you're choosing, uh, you've, you've chosen who you're seeing rather, you want to do everything you can to maximize patient safety. That's the safety of the person you're gonna see, as well as the safety of the people that you're not gonna see. And this is kind of, this kind of builds on what I've just said to you. So ask for things to be ready before you go and see the patient so you're not wasting time. 
simple things. Can they be, a, can, you know, can they bring a computer by the bedside so I don't need to look around the ward looking for a computer because I can't tell you the number of times there's been a, a peri arrest or an emergency call and I've had to be looking around for a computer I can log into. Um, can you bring the drug chart and the notes by the bedside? You need to know things like the escalation status. Are they DNAR? Are they for ward-based sealing of care? Or are they going to go to ITU or HDU if they get more unwell? So all of these things are things you can say to the examiners and that show that you can actually, aside from just talking through an A2E, you're actually thinking about the practicalities of doing this job. Um, escalate early if you need to. If they look really unwell, um, if they look like they're going to arrest, if the observations don't sound good on the phone, put out a peri-arrest call, a met call, or a cardiac arrest call, depending on what you want to say. Make sure you're communicating with your registrar, your other seniors as well. And verbalize when, you're, when you've reached the maximum of your clinical ability. So for example, if you're stabilizing somebody with acute heart failure, and you might go through A to E, sit them up, give them some oxygen, give them some furosemide, do an ABG, take a chest X-ray. And then at the end of it, you're probably gonna say, and I would reassess everything, but uh, at this point, I need some more senior advice um, to start having a think about why this has happened and how we can prevent the patient deteriorating again. Um, and then when you're doing your A to E, you treat everything as you go along. Don't move on to B or to C or to D or to E without solving a problem in the section before, because obviously you're not going to get anywhere by doing that. And make sure that you reassess. So you say that, OK, fine. So the patient has saturations of 85 percent on air. I'm going to put on 15 litres per minute of oxygen through a non-rebreather mask. And then I'm going to keep an eye on the observations. I'm going to keep an eye on the, on the oxygen saturations and reassess them continuously. Obviously, <clears throat> it's quite difficult in um, an OSCE setting or in an interview setting because your timing, you've only got 10 minutes. Um, so things do get sped, sped up, but just mention that you would reassess. Uh, they'll probably say, yeah, 15 minutes later, the oxygen saturations pick up. They're not obviously going to stare at you for 15 minutes. Any questions so far before I move on, because I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, I've seen your question, Ananya, about the rankings, and I'll come back to it at the end. OK, cool. So no questions so far. So I will move on to the next slide. This is just talking through the A to E approach. Um, so airway wise, I'm not going to talk you through this fully because you know this, hopefully, and you'll have the, you have the slides available via medal and the, um, the recording available on YouTube. But obviously, you're going to assess the airway first. You don't really need to say, I would assess the patency of the patient's airway. You can say, well, I'm going to assess the airway. If they're talking to me, then I'm happy. Uh, if there are added sounds or, or any other concerns, then obviously I do a more detailed assessment. Um, so you're going to look, listen, feel, um, and you're going to treat. So airway type things, um, airway maneuvers, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, airway adjuncts. Um, if you've got an airway problem because of choking or anaphylaxis, then obviously you're going to treat that. Now, what's different for each interview location, but also for each interview panel, is whether they interrupt you and give you findings or whether they let you just run through your whole A2E. Some of your inter I two interviews, one at Oxford, one at London, one in London, one of my interviews was very happy with me talking through the entire thing, not really stopping me. And the other one stopped me at each point and gave me findings and asked me how I would treat them. So you just need to read the room. You can actually ask them, um, and I did, I think, on both occasions. Uh, would you like me to just continue from A to E? Uh, will you stop me to give me, um, will you stop me when there are positive findings, or would you like me to stop after each section? That kind of puts the ball in their court, and it avoids this awkwardness where you're like talking over each other when you're trying to do something, trying to do the next thing, and then they say, oh, actually, no, let me tell you something about the breathing. So, um, I think that was quite a nice thing to do and you just need to find a good way of phrasing it for you and again this is where practice comes in so coming up with your phrases of what you're going to do before you see the patient how you're going to talk to the examiners about your a to e approach all of that kind of stuff really does come with practice and um, by the way guys stop me at any point by putting uh something in the chat if you have any questions um in each of these sections or about anything i'm saying then obviously you move on to breathing um again so your assessment would be your look, listen, feel. You're going to do some measurements, so ABG, 
chest x-ray, oxygen saturations, respiratory rate, etc. And you're going to intervene as soon as you uh, detect a problem. Oxygen is always a good thing. The Resuscitation Council actually advised that all critically unwell patients have oxygen, regardless of the oxygen sats, because you can always you can always turn it off. Um, so even at the beginning, if you want to be like, I put them on some oxygen because they're critically unwell, that's absolutely fine. Um, be aware that you can be asked questions around the topics. So say you've got somebody with an exacerbation of COPD um, and you manage them and they say, OK, well, the ABG comes back with a pH of 7.27. What would you do? So they're on 15 litres per minute of oxygen. The pH is 7.27. PCO2 is 8 and the PO2 is 7.5. What are you going to do? And they're on 15 litres per minute of oxygen. Yeah, 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 so definitely senior support. Uh, yeah, maybe refer to ITU for ventilatory support and uh, maybe just turn the oxygen down a bit and accept a slightly lower PO2 uh, and say, you know, you can talk about you can talk about why you might be doing that because of the carbon dioxide retention. And then a follow up question could be, yeah, if they've got COPD. Yeah, so this is an exacerbation of COPD. Yeah, a question could be, tell me how you would give them oxygen then. And you might need to talk to them about not the colours, but the fact that you can give venturi masks uh, to achieve a particular uh, FiO2. Um, or that BiPAP might be required later on. So just be aware, don't be surprised rather if you are stopped and asked random questions in the middle. It's not common that it happens, but you should be prepared for it to happen. And that means when you're practicing, please uh, push each other and um, interrupt and ask questions because it's very easy to talk through an A to E. It's very difficult when, you, when your flow is being interrupted, when you're having to actually make management decisions etc and that's the hard part so make sure when you are practicing you're not just running through it but you're stopping and having the other person ask you questions or challenging you um etc um and then circulation so this is probably the easiest one um so again you're going to do a basic assessment with your observations your clinical assessment don't forget things like peripheral edema which we didn't put on here um i guess this is fluid balance uh, pulse jvp auscultation etc um and then your bloods uh, making sure that you've got sufficient vascular access um if you think that somebody's bleeding then obviously say things like i would send off a group and save if you've got somebody who's bleeding and is shocked, then you can say things like, I put out a major hemorrhage call at this point. So again, it's about showing that you know how to do the job of a doctor, not just talk through A to E. And then your interventions are gonna be fairly straightforward here. So fluid resuscitation, blood transfusion specifics. Um, if they've got ACS, then obviously you're gonna think about giving them some aspirin, doing an ECG, seeing what that shows, and obviously that will, that will help you decide how you treat them going onwards. Um, so be comfortable with the common immediate management for all of the uh, most likely clinical emergencies you'll be faced with. So there are a couple of things that you can almost guarantee a fair game to come up. Acute, so everything on here, so sepsis, ACS, fluid overload, pulmonary edema, PE, fast AF, major hemorrhage. Um, yeah, that's probably it for circulation really. Airway and breathing wise, asthma exacerbations, COPD exacerbations, anaphylaxis. Um, you might have diabetic emergencies, hypoglycemia, DKA, all of that kind of stuff. So the really common clinical emergencies are the ones that will come up. You're not going to get, I mean, if you look at the people say look at the Oxford Handbook, the emergency section at the back, and I think that's good advice. But don't spend your time. I mean, I might come to regret this, but I wouldn't say spend too much of your time looking through how to treat neurogenic shock, for example, or how to treat an Addisonian crisis, because those things are unlikely to come up. They're beyond the scope of what an F1 should be able to manage by themselves. So these are things that you should be able to stabilize immediately when you start working and then escalate for further advice. And I've personally, in, in two and a half months of F1, had to deal with somebody in, in flash pulmonary edema um, after an MI by myself, 
which was actually my one of my interview questions. So um, yeah, they, they, they aren't unreasonable. They will give you things that you will be expected to know from medical school and also just generally for life and clinical practice. And then you're gonna go on to your disability um, interventions here, uh, hypoglycemia, any airway support. So if you haven't called for anesthetics and then you realize somebody's got a bit of a threatened airway or reduction in level of consciousness, then you might wanna call anesthetics now and get their opinion on whether they need to be intubated and then specific in intervention. So um, if they have had an overdose of something, reversing it, if they've got DKA, giving them fluids, insulin, et cetera, if they're having seizures, you should be familiar with what you would give and when. Um, and yeah, and, and just not forgetting that, again, these are common presentations that you see all the time as a doctor. Any questions so far on, on the A2E approach or, or anything I've said? Okay, no questions yet, that's great. Obviously, then you're gonna go, go on to exposure. Um, yeah, never, never forget to palpate the abdomen, never forget to say that you'd have a good look at the patient. Um, and you should, you should tailor what you say to what the clinical scenario is. So for example, if you've got someone with a fever um, and sepsis, um, you might say, well, I palpate the abdomen, I want to see if there is any suprapubic tenderness that could suggest a UTI. I would also want to have a look at the skin, make sure there are no breaks and that they don't have a cellulitis or anything like that. Um, I might even have a feel down the back and check that there's no infection um, hiding between the vertebrae. So you want to tailor what you're saying to your clinical scenario and that's how you sound good. And that's also what you do in real life. You're not mindlessly doing your A2E with no differentials in mind, even though it might feel like that sometimes. You do naturally focus more on certain things than others and show that you're doing that in the actual scenario because that's what differentiates you from just doing it from an algorithm. Um, do we need to know specific dose of medications, e.g. adrenaline, insulin? I would say for the common for the common clinical emergencies, I would learn the doses. There's no one, there's nothing anywhere that says you need to know them. That's the same for medical school as well. But it sounds a lot slicker if you can say, I would give half a milligram of one in 1,000 adrenaline rather than I would give some adrenaline, uh, I'd have to look up the dose. Um, it just sounds a lot better and, and you can be pushed for doses as well. Obviously, if it's something that's really out there or not used very commonly, then I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say you would need to know it. You can caveat everything you say with, of course, I would check with local guidelines and check the dose in the BNF, but um, from what I know, it's half a milligram of adrenaline I am. Uh, for DKA, it's 0.1 units per kilogram of insulin. Um, things like furosemide for heart failure, I would also I would also know. Um, but anything more specialist, I, I would say, isn't really. Like I wouldn't learn the doses of treatment dose heparin or a DOAC for a PE. I would just say I'd put them on treatment dose heparin and get a CTPA. If that makes sense. So these are some possible scenarios. I took this from a really good talk from um, uh, an Imperial um, SFP uh, presentation that's online. Uh, I think this is a really good starting place in terms of where to focus your revision. I would start off with the scenarios you're least comfortable with. So you might be really comfortable with anaphylaxis, with STEMIs, N-STEMIs, tachycardias, etc. But I would start off by looking at the things you're not so familiar with, um, because those are the things that you, you really need to drill down and then do the easier ones a bit closer to the time. Um, there's also a really good document from the Resource Council online with uh, common drug doses and, and, com and a, a summary of the ALS guidelines for things like tachycardias. And I'll see if I can find it and put it in the chat shortly. But I just take a picture or screenshot of this page and aim to at least cover these and then have a think about if you want to do anything more than this. But I think this is very, very, um, very fair game. Um, I don't think you'll get anything 
obviously can't guarantee, but I don't think you'll get anything peds related or obs and gynae related. So, you know, I think it's very unlikely you're going to have like a postpartum hemorrhage, for example. I think that'd be quite unfair. So this is an example. I'm going to give you all about three, four minutes to read this. And I'm going to see if I can put up a poll to tell me who you're going to see first. Okay, a couple more responses before I talk to you about this scenario. Okay, cool. So we've got uh, three quarters going for patient two and a quarter going for patient one. Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but I would agree with the people who are saying that they would see patient two first. Can you give me, so regardless of how you answered, can you give me a reason why you would see patient one first regardless of whether you thought that was the right answer or not what what sort of what goes through your mind that these aren't easy scenarios so what goes through your mind to think let's go and see patient one first mm -hmm. yeah so the potassium level is scary they're acutely unwell now okay great um so uh, for patient two, drowsy in it. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Airway compromise risk, that's for patient number two. Patient one has the potential to get unwell soon. So yeah, even even if you answer patient two, tell me how you can justify seeing patient one first, because you can. So yeah, patient one has the potential to get unwell soon. Ideally, you would see all of these patients, right? Patient two is unwell now, exactly. So um, what I would do is risk of arrhythmias for patient with cardiac risk, exactly. So there are reasons to see patient one first. And there are reasons to see patient two first. I don't think there are really reasons to see patient three first, although I'll come on to that in a minute. So what I would do is I would say I can I recognize that there are multiple unwell patients here um, who all require my attention. However, I would want to see patient number two first, the reason being that they have become very drowsy, they're unresponsive, and therefore they're at risk of losing their airway. That being said, I think patient number one has a potential to become very unwell. Um, what I'd like to do is ask the nurses to do an ECG to check for any uh, ECG changes of hyperkalemia and also do a repeat set of bloods, including a VBG, just in case this is a spurious sample, because this is just a one-off. Uh, I would then contact my SHO or registrar and let them know what's happening and see if somebody could help me uh, see all of these patients. I would leave patient number three until last, reason being they're not currently acutely unwell. However, there is obviously a risk to staff members and to the patient themselves. I would ask the nursing staff to supervise him on a one-to-one -one basis and also maybe call security if he becomes aggressive. Um, and then I'd go and see him as soon as I can. Does that kind of make sense? So you're saying, oh, sorry, and for patient number one, uh, you can say that 
I would tell the nurses if they if they could put out a peri arrest call or an emergency call if the potassium comes back any higher or if they're concerned for any reason. Now, all three of these um, cases are common things to see. So potassium of 6.2 um, by itself doesn't mean anything. Uh, well, doesn't not mean anything, but, but can be interpreted in a number of ways. Is this a spurious result? Was the uh, sample on the ward for ages before it got to the lab? The person has renal failure. Do they normally run at quite a high potassium anyway? Are they due for dialysis tomorrow? Um, and therefore their potassium will come down. So what you really need to do here is an ECG to check for changes, VBG and a repeat set of bloods to check whether 6.2 is real or not. Um, patient number two, you need to see first, most probably. Um, they could be hypoglycemic um, because of the insulin. They could be, they could have cerebral edema because of the DKA. They could have hypokalemia because of the amount of insulin they get, you know, they're getting. So there are lots of things that could be wrong with patient number two, and hopefully you'd pick them all up in your A2E. And patient number three literally had this the other day. Person started hitting somebody with their walk. Old lady started hitting nice and soft with their walking stick. Not very pleasant. But again, at least the patient isn't unwell. And for the most part, two nurses can hopefully contain this 82-year-old until we can go and see them, assess their capacity, maybe de-escalate things verbally uh, before prescribing a sedative. What you need in all of these cases is more information before you go and see the patient. So for patient number two, again, can I have an up-to-date ECG? Can I have a VBG on the way? Uh, can you do a blood glucose and ketones again? All of that is going to give you a lot of information. Any questions about these three patients or why you would prioritise each one over the other? Great, no questions so far. If you come up with any, please do let me know. And then there are other things that could come up. So we've talked a lot about clinical uh, scenarios. Is it usually three patients? Varies, I think more than three would be mean um, because of the prep time that you have. Uh, and again, like I said, not all, of the, not all of the deaneries will give you three patients. Some might just give you one. Some might give you one in a different scenario. So you have to speak to people who have done it before um in terms of how many they gave you might not always need to prioritize them they might just ask about one patient and then ask you more detailed uh management of that patient or they might ask you to prioritize three and then do a, a more brief bit on the management of them other things that could come up communication scenarios dealing with an angry relative for example um i don't i don't think it would be like a a role play sort of scenario but you know how you would go about talking to somebody about a sensitive topic. Ethical dilemmas, uh, capacity, consent. So for example, the last one poses a bit of an ethical dilemma, and this is a dilemma I had on my own call the other day. If you're, if somebody is verbally aggressive, threatening to leave the ward and you don't let them leave the ward, what do you have to do? What do you have to do if you're keeping someone in hospital against their will, pretty much? You're not letting them out. Uh, so Section 8 is not a bad shout. That's more of a, a mental health um, thing. Uh, but yeah, usually these things come under the deprivation of liberty safeguards of the dolls. So um, if you get time at the end and they ask you, okay, quickly tell me about patient number three. It looks really good to be able to say, well, I need to do a capacity assessment. They don't have capacity and I think they need to stay in hospital. I would need to put into place a dolls um, so that we can keep them in hospital and then deal with things. Um, so that's an ethical thing, capacity to, to stay in hospital or to accept medical treatment. Um, dealing with an error. So, you know, it might be the case that it's like, um, somebody's received double the amount of insulin they should have they haven't come to any harm what would you do you might need to talk about the duty of candor to tell people uh, about things when they go wrong even if they don't result in harm uh, you might have to talk about being honest and owning up to errors in clinical practice less likely discussions surrounding end-of-life care dnar and, and treatment escalation 
and who you need to discuss them with before implementing them. And then medical questions related to your scenario. So depending on how your scenarios are going, you might be stretched at the end with a few quick fire questions. I know I was. Um, I had some random things thrown at me at the end of my interview uh, that I, I didn't really see coming, but they were, they were just random medical questions, um, loosely related to what I was talking about. Um, do we need to know reference ranges for blood tests? I wouldn't say so. I don't think you'll get a large number of blood tests, but obviously you would need to know the common thing. So potassium, um, what would be considered high or very high, glucose, um, trying to think about other things. That's it really, like I, I, nothing outside of what you would need to know immediately off by heart to manage the conditions in the other slide. So COPD, asthma, you want to know what normal PO2, PCO2, pH is, what a normal bicarb is maybe as well. But aside from that, you don't need to know what normal chloride is, if that makes sense. So no reference ranges for common things. And, and even if you know a ballpark and you can say oh, that, that that bicarb sounds high, if it's 32, you don't know that the, the normal is under 28. Being able to say that that sounds high, I think they're a chronic CO2 retainer, it's fine. Because no one's expecting you to know everything off by heart. The other thing I would say is, is when you don't know something in these scenarios, it's quite important to be honest and say, to be honest, I don't actually know, to be honest, I don't actually know too much about the condition. This is how I would manage it. But I'd look up guidelines on X, Y, or Z. If you've got sepsis, and say, well, I'd prescribe antibiotics um, according to my local guidelines. I'd look up uh, what they are on Microguide, for example, which is an app that all NHS hospitals use, or on the BNF, for example. So that is, that's a lot of me talking. <clears throat> I'd really appreciate it if you could give us some feedback. Um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, a big thank you to previous Mind the Bleep SFP teams, because we've used a lot of material from their slides. So if you could give, give us some feedback, that would be fantastic. It just means that we can try to smooth things out for the future and make sure that we're giving you um, education that's genuinely useful. Are there any other questions? I've got some time now. Um, there was a mention about a police officer coming to talk to you about an injured patient. Can you talk about your approach to that and preserving confidentiality? Yeah, so this is a very difficult one, um, and it depends on it depends very much on the scenario. So if the police officer has there, are, okay. So there are some circumstances where you have to uh, where you have to disclose certain information. So, for example, gunshot wounds, knife crime. No, maybe not even knife crime. Gunshot wounds for sure. You don't need to tell the police who they are, who the person is, or the circumstances, just that there's a person in the department with a gunshot wound or whatever. The other thing you have to do is if you are aware that a crime is taking place or could immediately take place, you should let the police know, obviously, to stop uh, further badness happening. Other more niche things are things like fem female genital mutilation in children. You need to report that to the police as a duty to do so. And then the police coming to talk to you about an injured patient depends on the scenario. Remember that in terms of confidentiality generally, there's always this clause of a public interest disclosure. So if someone's broken their leg and you suspect it's because there's been, a, there's been an altercation, physical abuse at home and they've got a young kid, I would say that's kind of fair game to disclose to the police because there's a risk of harm to somebody else. Whereas if they've broken their leg, because they've done something stupid in the garden and the police come and ask about it. There's no real reason to be disclosing that information. I'd recommend having a look at GMC, Good Medical Practice, um, like the shortened version of it, to look at things like confidentiality and just revise those common ethical scenarios because they could come up. Would I mind sharing roughly where I needed to rank to get Northwick Park? No, of course not. Um, I, um, I ranked, I ranked the Northwick Park jobs at the top because I, it's my local hospital and I really wanted to work there. Um, personally, I ranked um, in the top, I want to say top 16-ish applicants, but I know people that got Northwick Park who had ranked in the 50s as well. So you have to remember that not, although some hospitals are seen as more competitive than others, not everybody wants the same thing. So 
you might be 60th and get a job at a central London hospital. So for example, I was a fairly highly ranked applicant, but I didn't rank any of the central London teaching hospitals up top because I had different priorities. So uh, it you can't you can't really extrapolate from where people rank, just rank as highly as you can and then rank where you want to work in order of where you want to work and hope for the best. Do I know of any good resources to find example clinical scenarios to practice with? Um, I struggled this, with this, to be honest, when I was um, when I was practicing. There are a handful online if you Google. So for example, this Imperial, um, if you Google Imperial SFP, uh, Imperial London SFP interviews, there's a really good PDF um, and that's got, I think, two scenarios in it. Aside from that, the London Applicant Guide has a scenario in it. What I found really helpful, uh, and we will try and send you out some scenarios as well um, if we get a chance to, what I found was really helpful was um, making up scenarios with friends, and that was both for the clinical and the academic interviews. Um, and every time I practiced with a friend, I would we would each make up one or two scenarios, and that was actually very good revision in itself. Because if you think, if you're making up the academic one, you start to think about points and how to appraise the abstract, and then you hear your friend do it, that's really useful. And it's the same thing for the clinical. You start to think about what your friend should say or what the priority should be, and then they might say things that you hadn't thought of before that are really useful to you. You learn off each other like that. So I would say um, better than just reading out scenarios or, or looking at them, making them is, is good, it's a good thing to do. And I would also extend that to your OSCEs for final year if you've still got OSCEs left. Any more questions? Okay, so it looks like there's no more questions at the moment. Thank you very much guys for coming. Um, our email address is up there, so sfp at mindthebleep.com if you think about, if you think of anything. Um, but good luck with the practice. Hopefully you found this useful. Um, and if you do have any um, anything that you want to, that you want us to cover in the future with regard to the SFP stuff, please do let us know on the email and we'll try our best to get that sorted for you. So thank you very much again and have a good rest of the evening.